talking about 23, chapter 3, verse 24. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to review a little bit. Talking about through the redemption. Remember what we discussed or learned about Jesus purchasing us back so that we could be united with God anymore? Remember, there was three different things that we explained or talked about. Um remember the third one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Payment. Payment. You remember number one, we talked about bondage that we, by nature, we were born sinners and we're slaves to sin, 100%. You know, we're under the um, sin and the devil. But how do we break free from that? We break those chains of sin through Jesus. That's our deliverance. He came and died on the cross and was resurrected, and he did that in our place. And then we'll discuss more on this this morning. And third, Jesus was the payment for our sins. He paid it off, that there was nothing left. So when Jesus paid off for the person who accepted payment, for ransom, he said God, not the devil. The devil was not paid a ransom. You know, some people talk about that, that it was a payment to the devil for our sins. No, it was a payment to God the Father. Okay. Now, redemption, salvation, who did that? Who did all of that? Jesus did. So that came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in his doing, is there any way that we helped him save us? No. Only through Jesus Christ. You know, I'm going to ask you a question. Any way that we helped him? Because so many people believe, oh yes, it's important that we believe in Jesus. But we need to do works. To make his work accomplished here on earth. No, God can accomplish that by himself. And we'll discuss that now in this next verse of 25. Okay, remember we arrived this this morning recently. I did. For God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. And I'll explain that here shortly through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, which means he suffered, he had left the sins committed, you know, talking about the Old Testament saints, those people who trusted in God, For he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He didn't punish them. So we're going to discuss this verse this morning. So the point here is that we're going to talk about is the sacrifice of atonement. Atonement, what does that mean? That word atonement. So we're going to discuss that this morning. Any of you have an idea of what that means? Atonement? Sacrificing of life? Um, it's close, yes. But the word atonement, loan, forgiveness. It belongs to with forgiveness, yes. Atonement. So many people don't really understand the meaning of this word. So I'm going to explain it. So we have to look back in the Old Testament about the ark. Remember the story of the ark? You know, talking about animal sacrifice, yes, it's all related to that because it says, Megan says, that the sinners have committed before was left unpunished because the Old Testament had laws. Is that what you're talking about before or after? We're talking about Moses' time. 
we're talking about the law, Megan says. So there's no real punishment for their sins because they had sacrificed animals at that point. Yes, and that's what we're talking about and how it's related to the Old Testament, this word of atonement. I've seen some people sign it atonement, but really atonement is, you know, more of an animal blood sacrificing, you know, like the blood the blood of animals in the ark. But I'm going to sit here and explain this. So, back to the meaning of sacrifice of atonement. I have another verse, but it's different in the ESV version. Verse 25 says, Whom God have put forward as a perpetuation. What does that mean? I'm going to give it a sign, and what's the sign for propitiation? Oh, I thought he was asking. I love that. Blocking what? That means blocking God's wrath. You know, because God has wrath. Yes, it's almost the same. It doesn't mean that, you know, I fight it off. You know, that I'm trying to struggle to ward back God's wrath. No. What it means is a peace. Let me explain that one. For example, a father gets angry at maybe one of his children. And the mother goes, oh no, uh-uh. I did, he did wrong, you know, and I understand that. But the father is still very angry, and the mother's trying to calm him down, making appeasing him, and the father's anger starts to subside. So that's what that word, um, God's anger, is subsided. God absolutely hates sin. Is God mean? No. <clears throat> He's always just. We sin, and that's horrible. Absolutely awful. Because that breaks God's law, and it's against his righteousness. Sin, we don't think sin is horrible sometimes. Well, that wasn't so bad. No, uh-uh. It's awful. Sin is breaking God's law. He is our creator, and he is just, and we are wrong. So often people think God loves, he loves, he loves. Wow, you know, God understands that we sin and it's okay. No, that's not right. Sin is horrible. You know the word treason? You know what that word treason means? Anybody can explain that one maybe? Well, like um, with uh, America, if you're an American <coughs> and you, you go against the government, then you've, you've done treason against, against them. So, yeah. so that means it's like we're Americans, we go to another country and we are against the American government, you know, that's treason. So maybe an American goes to another country and becomes a spy against America, that's horrible. That's called treason. It's the same idea. Treason is against God's creation. So sin is that same thing. It's against God. T R E A. Traitor, I'm sorry. Traitor, yes. That's what you mean. The person is called a traitor. Yes. God's anger means that he's wrong? No. We are wrong. So the sign for propitiation means appeasing God's wrath. For all people of the world? No. 
those who have not believed in Jesus yet, his wrath is still on them. God's wrath is still against them. Those who are without Christ, yes. His anger is laid upon them. Those who do not believe in Jesus. But understand, when we're talking about Jesus doing everything on the cross, he appeased God's wrath for us who believe in Jesus. Is that clear? You know, I'll explain this more in depth. You might be a little bit shocked. You know, when I was reading this, I was too. So back to the Old Testament, I mean New Testament uses this word Hebrews chapter 9, above the ark. You know the ark we talk about, the box in the temple? The holies of holies were the cherubim, you know, they're angels that were on top of the ark of glory. It represented God's glory, the cherubims did. You know, as they had their wings folded down and looking into the ark, it overshadowing atonement. Again, here's that word, atonement cover. Atonement. Remember before I signed it as atonement? I don't really like that sign. But anyways, um, maybe we'll have to invent a sign for ourselves for atonement. But just hold that. We'll discuss that sign later. But the point of this is the atonement cover. That he poured it out? No, let's look at the nurse verse. It's the same verse, it's just the second, another version. This is the ASB, American Standard Version. Now they re replace atonement cover with mercy seat. Talking about mercy seat for the people. Just because a mercy seat. What is that? That Jesus sits on the mercy seat in heaven. Yes, that is what that's talking about. So here's the Ark of the Covenant. And we're talking about the chair. And that's the mercy seat. And that represents God's glory looking down. Like the high priest could enter in. Yes long time ago, the high priest, now Jesus is our high priest. He's our high priest forever. He paid for sin once, and that is done. Going back to the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 25, verse 21, it says, put the cover on top of the ark. You know, recently we are talking about the cover. You know, that's called the mercy seat. And put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law that I will give you. You remember Moses explained this. He says, he was explaining you're going to make an ark and then you're going to put a cover on it and I'm going to give you some tablets. You know, they were made out of stone. You remember when Moses came down from the mountain? You know, he had two tablets with him made out of stone. And people believe, like, yes, the Ten Commandments. People believe that one person, or one of them was the Ten Commandments on one tablet, like one to five, and then six to ten was on the second tablet. But then some people believe that the tablets were copies of each other. So, you know, nobody really knows for sure if it was the same or if it was one to five and then six to ten. Nobody really knows. But the point of this is that, yes, God's law, there was ten commandments. That's exactly what this is. And they were going to put it inside the ark. Why in the ark? Just to say, because God is holy and we need to follow his laws. Yes. 
Anything more that's right in the ark is like holy. It is so glory, much glory, just like God's word. Very important scripture. It should be the center of everything. Understand that Christ himself is the word. But at the same time, why is there a mercy seat on top of that? Come on, Megan. To appease his wrath. Yes. Yes. So, it's very interesting that some people believe, hold that for a moment. That the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, And Aaron's rod was the same rod that Moses threw down in Egypt to the Pharaoh, and it became a snake. You remember that story? And that rod changed the river, the Nile River, to blood, and that it represents God's power. Then what is this? This is manna. It's bread that God provided to the Israelites when they were hungry. You know, they were in the desert for 40 years, and God provided them with manna to remind us that God is powerful and he can provide. He provides. It's not based on us. So people believe that the tablets, the rod, and the manna were inside the ark. So understanding that all these three items inside the ark is in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 9, and it says there is nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it. Okay, well, it all that, that verse says all it was in there was the Ten Commandments. And then the next in Hebrews 9, 4 says the ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. That's the Ten Commandments. And it says that that's in the ark, but in 1 Kings it says nothing about those two items. So I thought the Ten Commandments, he broke one, and now there's two. Okay, we'll explain that. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 2, I'm not ha I don't have it here, but the verse said and it explains that Moses told the Levites, one of the tribes of Israel, go ahead and build the ark and put the cover on it, and I will give you the law the Ten Commandments that is same on those broken stones and I will put them down and give them to you so the ones that were broken what happened to those and I'll tell you you know there's some debate for example the Jewish people Jesuits do not believe the Messiah, the high priest, did that atonement for us. They believe in their, the ark, are two sets of two tablets, but they're broken and put in there from at the time of Moses. Israel, you know, waiting, went ahead, oh, when they were waiting for Moses to return, they started worshiping idols, and Moses broke the tablets, and they believed that the broken tablets, and that there was a new set of tablets made and placed in the ark. 
but there is no verse that explains that at all. Some people believe what is in that what is in there is actually the broken tablets, not remade. And then some people believe that there were recreations put in there. But that's not the point. So let me explain here. There are two tablets. Some were broken. Know that there's a second set. But it's not important. That's not the point. But why is there a difference with one scene that there were two stones, only two stones, and then the next verse says that there was a golden jar of manna and a staff in the ark. But this talking about now the ark is the temple and some people believe that that's what the ark is referencing in Hebrews. That it's outside the ark. It's not very clear. There's a lot of debates and it's not very clear. I don't think I ever remember reading that. So, that's right. So, could he have put the the broken tablets in there, or do you mean that a second set? Some believe that the broken ones in there, and some believe that there's a second set that was made and put in there. So the point is, is that it is in the ark, and that these two tablets sit there. And that's what we're talking about. And this is an important point, is the ark. You know, broken or second set, you know, is there a jar of manna in it, in the rod? You know, we need, that's not important. We're trying to get to the important point, is that the law was in the ark. Why was the law in the ark? It was to show that we had broken his law, that we had broken it. Who is we? All of us. We've broken the law in the Old Testament. You know, Israel broke those laws and those laws that were contained in the ark. And that's the reason why there is a mercy seat that covers. So Jesus' blood, the same idea, covers our sins. No, it's not just that, just a covering. So I'm going to explain this more. So back to Exodus 25, it says, Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the tablets of the covenant law. <clears throat> so the same thing we explained, this was to symbolize our sins and that we had broken his law, period. That's what that symbolizes. So do we have a verse? It's very interesting. Maybe it'll surprise you. And you know, Moses is talking here. He's building a room, I mean the ark. Different furniture into the temple, into the tabernacle. You know, it was a tent at first that they could move because they were nomadic for 40 years. And by King David's son, Solomon, you remember that before King David, Solomon established a temple. And that's what they built. He wrote, God's law did not appear to only be the Ten Commandments. That there was more. It's what it appeared like. There was a book. Clearly, we don't know what was in it, but that book of law is very interesting. Take this book of law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. Therefore, it will remain as a witness. Witness means that that book there sits to the side of the Ark, and it is a witness against you against you, a witness against you. You know, 
the Levites who built the temple against us. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked, meaning unmovable, you know, rebellious, stubborn, you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I'm still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? What does that mean? It means when Moses was there leading them through the desert for 40 years, the, he knew that the people would be rebellious against the Lord. But then after Moses died, you know, Israel really became rebellious against God. And it seems like Moses was special and holy. No, Moses himself was a sinner just like us. But God gave him grace, and he understood the Lord's way. He understood what it meant to live a holy life, and that God had taught him that. But Moses was not special and holy like the Catholics believe. Like Mary, the mother of Jesus, he was still a sinner. Moses was. It seems like Moses was elevated. He says, you will abel, rebel against us. It says, we. But why did he say you? Because God put Moses as a picture pointing towards Jesus. He gave foresight to Jesus. Yes, Moses was a sinner. Yes, he was. So it's very interesting here that the law there was put there as a witness against you. It was God's design, the ark, the book of law, as a witness against you before the people of Israel even rebelled. So before he did it, yes, God knew it. He was very clear in his design. You know, before he created the earth, he already had mercy for us. So that's why he had to place a cover on top of the ark. And that cover, what does that mean? Is it from the Jewish word? Yes. Cover from the Hebrew word kapotrith, mm -hmm. and it has been translating to mean mercy seat. And that's the picture of the appeasement against God's wrath. So there's more translated. A more accurate translation would be thing for perpetuation means the uh, perpetuation or the place of perpetuation. So that word perpetuation is already connected from the Hebrew word and it's translated into the mercy seat. Things for the appeasement means of appeasement, a place of appeasement. Is it two different translations? No. If you find the Hebrew word meaning, um, the English word, there's not an exact translation. You know, so Hebrew has lots of words. Their way their vocabulary is very picturesque. And like the Old Testament has many pictures and examples. And so the Hebrew language is perfect for that. So it's a very vocabulary that's very broad and English vocabulary is not. Meaning that we have a meaning of two different things while the Jews maybe have several for meaning for one of the same things, right? Same as the Greeks. Some sign Greek. The Greek language is very huge. 
in vocabulary, like the word love. They have agape, eos, just all different types of words for love. Abstract things. You know, the New Testament has a lot of abstract ideas and concepts. And the Old Testament uses a lot of pictures or picturesque type words. And so the New Testament from Greek, so like ASL, God created that for us. So that's why some of the Jews and the Greek, the words, you know, trying to match it into an English translation, sometimes it's hard to find that particular word that explains it. And you have to reference back to the language that it comes for, from. So translations in the Bible are wrong, and this is right. No, that's not, you know, you kind of have to explain or pick out the right words to kind of fit what the meaning was in Hebrews. That's the reason some, you can only use the King James Version. No. And some people believe the ESV, and that's the one I prefer, the most accurate, it doesn't matter. If you want the perfect verse in Scripture, then you'll have to go study Greek and Hebrew <laughs> and memorize that. Arabic, yes. The Jews, Hebrews, and then Arabic, I think. Which can you choose the Bible? How will I know which Bible version is right? So if you want the perfect 100% translation or as it was written, and there is none. No, it's not, it's confusion. We study the Bible and we catch the meaning and we have to reference back. It might have been a different word, but it explains it different. Propitiation, okay. We'll explain this more here in a minute. Okay, so mercy seat is, we're going to explain that a little bit more. So hold that thought. Now the Greek word almost has the same as the Hebrew word, heliastrion, came to denote not only the mercy seat, it was more in depth. The Hebrew word was mercy seat, but this word in Greek also included the propitiation or the appeasement. And so in Hebrews, it had limited meaning, but this word in Greek has both meanings. People believe that the Hebrew language is the best and the Greek translation was wrong. No, that's not true. God used both of them, both the Hebrew and the Greek. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, you were asking which is the best. Well, um, Every version was written during a particular culture by m men. Yeah. So, yeah, right. yeah. like the King James Version is old English. People used to use that a long time ago. No, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, in 1930s, maybe 20s, 40s, and 50s, you know, Old pastors use that. They're used to the King James Version. Is it wrong? No. But today, we give it to the people that are young, read it, and they're like, they can't understand the Old English. So you have to add words to help them understand it or translate it to help them understand better. So it depends on the culture, and it depends on their background growing up and where they grew up. And some people prefer the King James Version or the ESV Version. There's nothing out there that is completely perfect. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he is, talking about Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice. Remember that word atonement. 
sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for all, but also for the sins of the whole world. So there's another translation in the ESV and the RSV. He is the perpetuation from the Hillamos. It's a different. It. It's same from the Greek root word for our sins, and he is the expiation for our sins. So, which one of these do they mean? So, a propitiation means appeasement. Expiation means the removal of sin. And the RSV is wrong, this version here. Read standard version. Is it wrong? Which one? What do you think? There's just different words or different words that they choose to use. You know, it makes sense. Same recently you were talking about there was a whole list of words, but English is very limited, remember? You know, how do you attach what word to it to make it? So then there might be a couple choices, you know, but it helps us understand what it might mean in a different perspective. I can't remember how to spell it, but it means that it's connected, that it's included in one Hebrew word. A synonym? No, that's not what I'm talking about. That both concepts or ideas are in that one meaning from the Greek word. No, Coexist. No. I can't remember. I wish I could help Kathy with that. <laughs> so if you say, no, 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 no. Propitiation is the, has too much, that's very emphasized. God's wrath is appeased, but our sins are not removed. And this one emphasizes that our sins have been removed, but that God is still angry because I'm still sin. You know, so it kind of goes back and forth. So which one is right? They're both right. You know, the double two things put together means the Greek word. And the Greek word included both. English is very limited, so sometimes we don't get it. So time, sometimes we have to back up, take the English word to what the Greek word was, and then we understand that both of these apply. And it makes sense in Romans chapter 3, <coughs> verse 25. It says, He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because, what does that mean? He sacrificed Jesus as an atonement for our sins on the cross. He did that, God did that, to show he was righteous. He doesn't, like, turn a blind eye to our sins and ignore our sins. No. He looks and watches us. And is very patient. Because in his forbearance, he hadn't punished him yet. He's being patient. Just like recently Megan explained that the people sacrificed animals in the blood. Right. That's the reason why he is patient. The blood of the animals 
covering their sins, yes, but it was not enough for the removal of their sins. They covered them. And when finally Jesus dying on the cross, it showed that God's righteousness was the same. He does not alter and accept sin, not at all. He shows that he is righteous. Look at the cross, how horrific that was. And it shows that God himself is holy. He doesn't alter or change or just and just accept our sins. No. He doesn't turn a blind eye. He does watch and is very patient until that final sacrifice of Jesus and his 